Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the UFC card for this weekend uh, from a DraftKings perspective. Uh, I'm going to be doing a separate video on how to approach it from a betting perspective. And for those of you who've been following these videos along, um, you know already that's a completely different approach. Uh, the idea, again, with DraftKings or uh, from a DFS perspective, is to presume at least to some degree that the lines that are created by Vegas and the props created by Vegas are somewhat efficient and kind of project results and ranges of outcomes based on that, where uh, MMA betting is more trying to find an edge uh, in those lines. Uh, and that's a completely different approach. Uh, nonetheless, this card is an absolutely amazing card from a DraftKings perspective. Um, I'm not saying it's an easy card. It's amazing in that it's amazingly instructive. Okay, if I were to show uh, someone new uh, about playing DFS uh, MMA, this would be a perfect card to, to explain it all to them. Okay? And as we go through, you, you will see why. Uh, I guess I don't need to keep you waiting. There's so many different ways to get scores. Um, and when you have fighters that are fighting against each other that have completely different ways to get scores, those fights tend to be much, much better from a DFS perspective than people think. Um, when you have a grappler, for example, who is going against a pure striker who's reliant on basically getting knockouts, those types of fights are extremely DFS friendly because it's the concept of win condition. Like if the grappler wins, it's because her or his win condition was accomplished. In other words, a grappler is not winning unless he can grapple, right? And, and a striker is not winning unless he can get, you know, get a lot of strikes or get a KO. And when you have two strikers going against each other, that's sometimes difficult to do, you know, because some one guy's good at striking, he's usually good at defending, and it's sometimes difficult. And likewise, when you have two grapplers going against after going after one another, it's not so easy for someone to get the best of the other person because they're they're familiar with both offense and defense. But when you have strikers versus grapplers, you end up with really important fights for from a DFS perspective. Um, the winner of those fights usually scores really well. And and what's cool about it is that. Um, Projection models are really not going to deal with that. In other words, projection models, they will give you a median projection, meaning you know, what, what, what score is kind of in the middle of the range of outcomes. But remember, for DFS purposes, number one, we don't care about getting a median score. And the other thing that's cool is that when you have these matchups, no one's ever actually getting the median score. You know what I mean? Like, like if, if the wrestler can overwhelm the striker, the wrestler is going to score really well. And if the striker overwhelms the, 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 the wrestler and gets the KO, for example, because the wrestler is usually not as good defending themselves or himself or herself, then they're usually getting a good score. So the median projections are not going to really uh, account for this. So your normal approach of just kind of running optimals based on median projections is not going to be the way to play. Okay? The other thing that's kind of neat about this card is that there is a lot of examples of that. And it's a pretty full card. Um, so you could be kind of a stickler for ownership. You know, like if you have three or four guys that all look kind of similar and one guy's not going to be as highly owned as the other, then you can make that call pretty easily. And it also provides uh, an interesting dynamic with respect to the main event. Uh, the main event, as, as you guys know, because it's five rounds, it creates this, this kind of points floor where it's just so much easier for either fighter in their win to get a good score. So the the five round main event fight, even though it's priced like any other fight, usually has an incredible edge over the others. And you know, you get these fighters are going to be 40, 50% owned, and it's sometimes pretty difficult to fade them because usually you have a card without a lot of upside on it. And you know, it's just kind of hard to, to, to dismiss that five round fight. But on a card like this, when you have so many opportunities to smash, uh, you can make the argument that the main event, even though 
in a vacuum is probably a good fight to target that because it's going to be really highly owned, you might, you might be able to make the case to fade this one. So let's go through kind of fight by fight. And we're, we're going to be, you know, doing the normal thing. We're going to take a look. We're going to be looking at the inside the distance props. But remember the inside the distance prop is, is, is only one piece of the puzzle, especially when you have striker versus grappler matchups, because even though a fighter might not finish the, the other, the other guy or the other gal, uh, they can still get an enormous score if, right, if they have the grappling upside, which almost every fight, seriously, almost every fight on this card has someone with, with wrestling upside to some degree, okay? Um, so let's just kind of take a look at it. And kind of right off the bat, we have uh, Garrett Armfield versus uh, jo Jose Johnson. Um, when you look at the inside the distance prop here, you have um, Johnson... Hold on a Sorry about that. Uh, so Armfield winning in this uh, by this inside the distance is when you account for the big about a plus one hundred and sixty. Which, given his price, which is only eighty five hundred, that in and of itself is pretty strong. I mean, it's not you know, it's not minus one hundred and ten or anything like that. But given that price, that's perfectly reasonable. And then even on the other side of this, you know, you have Johnson inside the distance about a plus 230. And again, given his price of 7,700, I think that's pretty reasonable. Um, so right off the bat, you have an inside the distance line, which is pretty strong. And the other thing about this fight is that Armfield has a decent amount of wrestling upside. Um, so not only does Armfield have that inside the distance uh, prop in his favor, not in his favor, it's very similar to Johnson's when you factor in price, but he's got that actual wrestling upside. So when he wins, I mean, he could actually, you know, get a submission or a, a finish with grappling upside with takedowns or something like that. So I think that this fight right off the bat is, is, is a really, really good way to start because Johnson, the only way, way he's winning, I think is, is by knocking Garmfield out. And if he knocks him out, that he's going to be optimal or at least close to it at 7,700. Right. And if Armfield, he gets the win, it's probably be a combination of either a finish or wrestling or both. And, and the fact is that Johnson has poor takedown defense. And one thing that's kind of cool about this is that is that it usually does take. Well, it doesn't always take two to tango, but it's, it usually does. Like you need a guy who's who's a good wrestler against someone that doesn't defend them all that well. You have a situation like that. You have a pretty smash spot. So. Armfield right off the bat is really, really strong. And yet Johnson on the other side is, is a pretty, pretty good play as well. Um, the next fight, Cowan versus uh, um, Haley, Haley, or Lean Perez. Um, this fight is probably one of the ones I'm least interested in. And even this one is not bad. So you have Haley Cowan a minus 130 against uh, Perez plus 110. So let's first look at the line make sure it's about reasonable um yeah i mean i guess perez might have a little bit of line value but but that's not what we're interested in here what we're interested in here is this i mean look at the inside the distance prop on cowan is extremely poor um like plus 400 plus 360 or something given her price is not good um it's only slightly better than perez but Perez has a tiny, has a little bit of wrestling upside, not not as much as as some of the others on this on this card. But I think in DFS, I mean, you're playing a bunch of lineups. I think you do have to play some Perez. I think that Cowan is probably the first of, of very few fighters I'll probably end up fading. It just has a bad combination of of no inside the distance prop and you know no wrestling upside. So I think that Perez is playable. The combination of the of the, the small line value and, you know, some, some wrestling and takedown and top control upside. I think that she's, uh, she's pretty viable. Um, moving on, uh, Alia versus Alves. Okay. So we'll take a look at the inside the distance prop here. Um, first of all, sorry, with respect to the line, Alia have 180 to 155. I presume it's something like 8,900 or so. Let's take a look. Yep. 8,800 versus 7,400. Um, from the inside the distance prop, you have Aliyev is like a plus 170 or so. 
maybe a plus 180, which is which is not the greatest for that price. But we'll get back to that in a second. Alves inside the distance is about a plus 300 or so. Um, now, plus 300, actually, it's a little more. It's more like plus 320. Um, it's not that bad um, for a price tag of, of 7,300. So we're going to include him for now. And, and one of the reasons we're going to is this is a pretty – Pretty straightforward uh, wrestler versus uh, striker matchup. Aliyev is completely going to be going for kind of chain wrestling and takedown and takedowns and things like that. So he, in addition to his kind of poor but not the worst inside the distance prop, has just a, a, a ton of wrestling takedown upside that will increase his score. And the way these guys' styles kind of match up, you know, Alves has one thing going for him, not one thing, but one main thing is that his go-to submission move is a guillotine, and he can get that on uh, Aliyev as Aliyev tries for all these takedowns. So you have this style that's kind of been made for some kind of finish, you know? So, so or not necessarily some kind of finish, but for some kind of big score. Like Aliyev, he doesn't need a finish to get a big score, although it certainly would help. Um, but Alves, I think, I think his win condition is probably – snatching up a guillotine or maybe out striking him and, and just going for it and getting a pretty, pretty high score. So here's another one. I mean, just, uh, uh, Aliyev is very similar. I think to Armfield, he's got a decent inside the distance prop with, with wrestling upside. And the other guy on the other side does have some, some KO upside. It's a little different though, right? Jose Johnson is more of the straight KO upside where Alves has a little bit of submission as well. So I think once again, I think this is a fight that 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 can score very, very well. Um right, Joe Selecki versus Carl Deaton. Uh you have a minus five hundred. Okay. Um so a minus five hundred, I presume he's gonna be ninety five hundred or something like that. And yep, ninety four hundred. So to 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 get there with ninety four hundred, to get the score that you're gonna need on a card like this at ninety four hundred, you're gonna need like i mean 120 points that you just are um so to get that you need either in my opinion like a like a almost almost favored to finish in the first round or at the very least a minus 120 inside the distance prop plus some wrestling upside okay like if you don't have wrestling upside at 9400 you better knock the guy out in the first round, okay? Now, when you look at Selecki here, his inside the distance prop, we'll take a look at it. Uh, Selecki inside the distance is a minus 110 or so, which is pretty good. It's not 100% what you need, but it's pretty good. Um, but when you combine that with his wrestling upside, which is undisputed, um, that makes him a very, very strong play at 9,500. Um, it's it's tough to pay that, but all the metrics just kind of point towards that direction. He gets the fight that he wants and gets a whole bunch of takedowns and then gets maybe even a second round submission with some ground and pound maybe. I mean, he could put up 130. And when you get guys that put up 130, we're going to get to another example in a minute, you just kind of want that. Um, now, I will also say that 130 is not exactly easy. You know, uh, he could get a first round submission and only score 110. And maybe that's not enough. So, but it's it's hard to dispute that he's a very, very strong play. And Carl Deaton, unfortunately, at plus 400, it just does not have enough win out, uh, enough win equity for me to play him. Right, uh, Charles Johnson versus Odie Osborne. Um, this, this is another one which is not exactly the most exciting fight. I mean, I mentioned that almost all the fights have this kind of, cool uh you know binary result i think this is one of the ones that do not so we'll take a look at it first of all uh charles johnson is only a minus 160 is favorite and he's being priced at 9k that's an awful price i mean i i would say that osborne at the very least has has win it you know he's only a plus 160 and he's 7200 so he's got line value kind of right off the bat. So that in and of itself makes him really, really strong. Um, should I say really strong? No, it makes him playable. Uh, as a matter of fact, I mean, 
because of that, Charles Johnson at 9K, unless he's got a really, really strong inside the distance prop, meaning, you know, minus 110 or something like that, I mean, it's probably going to be a fade. And when you look at it, Johnson inside the distance is, let's see, Johnson inside the distance is plus one, almost 200. I mean, that's that's going to be, I think, my first fade of the day is the Charles Johnson. Um, let's take a look at see Odie Osborne here. Odie Osborne inside the distance, maybe plus 400. Is that possible? It's actually not bad. Plus 320 at that price, plus his, his line value. I think Odie Osborne is a pretty good underdog here. Okay, uh, now we get to a whole bunch of kind of binary outcomes, sort of. So first one, you have Jordan Levitt versus Victor Martinez, and this is just a straight grappler versus striker. Okay, Jordan Levitt, he's just hopeless striking. He's not even, not even a great wrestler, really, um, but he likes when he gets to the mat, he's got all kinds of great jujitsu ju jiu and all kinds of great submissions. And then you have Victor Martinez, who is just the opposite. He's just much more solid striking. So the idea is that the winner of this fight is going to be their win condition, right? So, so you probably want to want to play these guys. Let's take a look at the inside the distance prop here. Like for example, uh, you have Martinez. His inside the distance prop is like only plus two hundred. Like at that price, it's an extremely strong play. Okay. And then you have Levitt, his inside the distance prop is pretty much the same, right? Uh, which is kind of interesting, right? <laughs> it's like, uh, but what Levitt has going for him is he's got the the the, the sort of the wrestling upside. Okay. Um, I do think that Martinez is probably the better play because I don't think that Levitt's takedown upside is 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 quite a big deal. I mean, he's not really that great of a wrestler. And he's not going to be the one to, to, to hold him on the ground and get a bunch of takedowns or something like that. He's going to take him down only for the purposes of trying to submit him. Um, he's also not really a ground and pound type of guy. So he's not going to pick up a lot of points there. So I do think that Martinez is probably the better play, but there's no disputing that both sides of this you know, can, are going to score well if they get what they want. Okay. So like Levin, even in a, like a second round submission, um, you know, he's probably going to be, almost good enough right but in a first round submission obviously 100 points is going to be plenty so this is um this is another rare very very good fight complete contrast in styles and whoever imposes his will is going to score very well then you have jasmine Jodav jodavicious against gabriella fernandez so here's another one straight wrestler jasmine versus gabriella fernandez who is a straight striker so you know, the winner of this fight is probably going to be able to score well because the other one can't really deal with the other one's skill set. Now, Gabriela Fernandez, though, her inside the distance prop is not really that good. I mean, it's, she's up like a plus 400. So I think that I'm probably going to end up passing on her. And Jenna Vicious, um, well, she probably has no inside the distance prop at all. She's like minus 700. Um, the question is, is is her takedown upside going to be good enough to smash? Um, the problem with, with her is that type of play is that there are just other fighters that have just more upside like that, like, like Garrett Armfields, Aliyev. I mean, these guys can really put like a score up there where I don't think that, ja that, that, that Jasmine is going to be the one to, um, to really smash, even if she gets a couple of takedowns. Um, What's her price anyway? I mean, she's 8,400. I mean, excuse me. So she's 7,800. Oh, all right. So because she's an underdog, I think that she's reasonable. You know, if she gets her takedowns, I'll put it another way. If she wins, it will be because she got her takedowns. Okay. Is that fair enough? So, and she, she's about to pick them to win. Um, I think it's very reasonable. Now, the thing is, is that, you know, even if she gets a couple of takedowns and wins, it still might not be enough. You know, like 85 points on a card like this uh, might not even sniff the optimal, if you want to know the truth. But at least to put you in the ball game. So I think that she's an okay play, but not a, not a great play. 
Okay, Trevor P versus Eric Gonzalez. Let's go. So this is going to be a this is going to be quite a quite a spectacle. Um, if you if you watch any of Trevor Peak's last two fights, you can find him on YouTube. You're just going to want to play. You know, you're just going to want to bet on him. You want to bet against him. Just all action, no all offense, no defense. Someone's going down here. And this is not this this is not a you know strikler versus grappler. These are just two guys who are just going to be swinging. Now, Eric Gonzalez does not quite have the same aggression as Trevor Peak, but he's got some experience. So if Trevor Peak, you know, he gets too aggressive, Gonzalez can certainly, you know, use his counters to get the KO also. So you look at the inside the distance props here. I mean, these are kind of ridiculous. You have Peak inside the distance is like minus 130. I mean, even with the big minus 125. Um, and his price is only it's even not even 9k I mean, it's 8900 and this is like smash city um and on the other hand uh gonzalez by tko alone is plus like 300 right uh gonzalez inside of distance maybe plus 280 which is certainly reasonable at his price and considering that 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 peak is probably going to be high owned because of what i you know because look he's great to be a good play you got pretty good leverage with gonzalez so this is another one just just fire it up you know, and and look, you are going to have to make decisions about which one of these you fire up, but uh, uh, this is certainly one of the one of the main fights to, to target both sides. All right, Mike Malott versus Johan Lyonez. Uh, we'll take a look at this one. This is not exactly a a wrestler uh, grappler versus a uh, striker. You could say that Malott's a little more you know well rounded. But it is basically striker versus striker. So in, in a situation like that, it's usually not the greatest, unless there's a really strong inside a distance prop like this peak line. Um, we'll take a look at it, though. Malat, his price, first of all, is 9200 So again, at 9200 he's got to at least have a minus 110 inside the distance prop. I think he's got exactly that. Let's take a look. Um, yeah, not bad. Minus 110. So he is a play. Not a smash play. Certainly not as good of a play as Peak, but he is a play. Um, on the other hand, Leonez, uh, uh, plus 380 or something like that inside of distance. It's not going to be for me. So this one is kind of a rough one. So you have Tatiana Suarez, who's like minus 800 coming off of a four-year layoff, all right? Now, her price is 9600 So what on earth do you need to do to pay off a $9,600 price tag? Well, what you need is you really need a combination of a finish and either a first round, almost in the first minute, finish or a finish after a whole bunch of takedowns and, and that is her win condition like if you look at her um at even her game logs i mean four takedowns nine takedowns two takedowns four takedowns three takedowns you know this this is this is her thing not to mention that the the nine takedowns against asparza and asparza was considered one of the best wrestlers in the world so um Nine and zero, oh, six to one or eight to one, with a high with with all these takedowns. The only thing is, is that she's off for four years. Um, and not only that, Della Rosa, uh, not, I, I, I meant Suarez, but that was one. Della Rosa, she's got some takedowns too. You know, um, now this is certainly no, you know, no, uh, whatchamacallit. Uh, it's just the level of competition, not even close. It's totally different. But there's something about when you have the two wrestlers going against each other that it doesn't always work out that the better wrestler just dominates. Okay. I want you to think about this variation. You know, like if, if, if somehow, uh, De La Rosa gets a takedown and, and controls the first round, then the then the slate is over. Like then then there's no way that Suarez can come back from that. 
at a payoff of 9,600. So it's one take, and that's what these, these girls are going to be doing. Okay. The other thing is that it's possible that, that Suarez gets one takedown around, just controls the whole round, and gets the decision. Is that going to be good enough? Well, I don't know. We want to find out. Let's 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 take a look just for just for fun. Let's 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 see what that would look like. Pull my UFC scoring tool here. Okay. So let's say that she got uh well let's let's just say 60 significant strikes. Uh, 60 strikes, 40 significant strikes. Let's say that she got four takedowns. Let's say they controlled her for uh, 10 minutes. That's a long time, right? Let's just see. 600 seconds. What does that get you? Uh, that gets you 88 points. That's all that gets you. That's four takedowns. And that's a huge bust. What if you got four takedowns over two rounds and you got actually a second round finish as a result of that? Now you're at 128. So this is this is this is this is the variation. Okay. This is the variation for for Suarez. Four takedowns, you get two rounds to do it. Well, actually, you can't control for 10 minutes in two rounds, right? So so let's control for six minutes. And that's how you get 120. And that should be enough. So, yep, I mean, she's a play. It's not someone you want to lock in, though, but it's definitely a play. Uh, and I'm not playing De La Rosa at those uh, at minus at plus 600. All right, uh, Dontel Mays versus uh, Sakai. Um, I don't anticipate this fight being a big deal. Um, the only thing I would say is that we have one possible wrestler here. Let's just take a look. First of all, the price, uh, Sakai looks like he should be about 8,400 or so, 8,300. And that's what we have, 8,300. Take a look at the inside of distance prop. Plus 220 is really all you need here. So maybe it's not bad. So Sakai win by mm, inside the distance is plus 220. I mean, not, not the worst. I mean, I've seen worse. That's not, it's really not bad. And then you have Maze inside the distance. Is about the same, about plus 210. So that's not bad either. And the other thing is that Mays does have some takedown upside. As we saw, I believe, was it his last fight? No, two fights ago. He had six takedowns. So this is definitely in his in his range of outcomes. So I I, I feel as though this fight is is certainly live. Um the inside the distance prop's good enough. And you could take either side. Um, so uh, yet another fight that could that I think that could, that could score pretty well. And if that's not enough, we got two more. So so Andre Muniz versus Brandon Allen. So 9,100, 7,100, we're expecting to see probably uh, probably minus 200 or something, minus 240. Uh, yeah, that's about right. Um, we'll take a look at the inside the distance prop here. We have... Oh, uh, Muniz inside the distance is, and we'll talk about the styles in a minute. Muniz inside the distance is got to be somewhere. Look at all of these props. Oh my God. All right. Muniz inside the distance, minus 120. Very, very strong. Allen inside the distance is not strong at all. It's like plus 500. And the thing is, is this, all right? I think Allen is going to be somewhat popular because he's a fighter that people have seen. They, people have bet on him before. He's been in every, it seems like he's in every card. And he's coming off, I think, a first round sub. Um, 
this the problem with this fight in general is that is that these Al, Allen could probably have an edge if he kept it striking um but also in grappling there there could be a lot of stuff going on like there could be reversals there could be takedowns and reversals um obviously takedown and reversals um so I, I do think that both sides of this are in play. I'm just not sure that Allen is going to be the greatest underdog at that ownership. So we just have to kind of take a look at it. Like, for example, I mean, what, what is Brandon Allen's uh, ownership going to look like compared to somebody like Odie Osborne? I would imagine Odie Osborne is going to be much lower on. Um, Brandon Allen fights the co-main event. People are going to want to play it. So I do think, once again, both sides are in play, but maybe Allen is not as, as great of a player. So the reason I brought all of this up, okay, is this. Let's just review. Armfield, totally awesome play, and Johnson on the other side. Uh, while Cal is not the greatest play, Perez, you can get some decent, you know, de decent low on play here. Aldiev Alves, both sides firmly in play. Selecki, smash possibility. Osborne, decent underdog. Martinez Levitt, both sides of this really in play. Joe, Joe DeVicious, uh, decent underdog. Gonzalez P, total smash spot. Um, Malat, uh, Malat, not bad, not so much for Linez. Uh, Suarez could smash. Sakai and Mays, each of these guys could deliver. Uniz and Allen, both these guys could deliver. The reason I bring all this up is you have the main event that's going to be owned 35% each, each fighter because what happens is is that when you run median projections, both these guys are going to show up as having a good median projection because you have five rounds to work with, okay? Um, and when you, when you look at the metrics here between these two, take a look. I mean, it's definitely not bad. I mean, look at spans. Well, let's look at Krelov first. Uh, one second. Oh, we have a little bit of delay here. All right, so Krelov inside the distance is is minus one ten, which is which is fine. I mean, it's it's really not bad. I mean, at at his price, um, at eighty seven hundred, I mean that's that's perfectly perfectly fine. Um, it's actually a, it's a pretty good. It's pretty good. And considering he has wrestling upside, I think he's a very good play. Um, Span on the other hand, we'll take a look at him. Span inside the distance is plus 200, which for his price is extremely strong. The problem with this, and now again, I'm not saying that they're not good plays because they both are, but if these guys are both going to be 35, 40% owned, there are a lot of fights on this card that can outscore it. Okay. And the chances that this fight, in my opinion, I'm not going to simulate this is in the optimal is probably less than the ownership on these fighters. Um, so I'll just kind of, I don't want to leave you with that. We'll talk about this a little more, but, but even though both these guys are very strong plays, I don't think you have to play them, especially in, in the deeper MME tournaments. I mean, I, I'm probably going to end up doing it. I'm probably going to end up playing them, but, but, I'm really considering the idea of just Xing these and, and hoping that 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 you get six big ceilings and you will. So the question is if I if the six big ceilings accrue to me, like if, if I can get six big ceilings and then just fade the ownership in this last fight. Um keep in mind also that the more kind of like intelligent X's you can make. I mean, you have a lot of combinations that you're going to want to get to an MME, you know. Um, so if you can X out the top owned uh, fight, um, again, it's 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 rough. But I think in the big MME where you're trying to take down the whole cheese and get a unique lineup, I think this is the card to try. I'll just I'll just say that. Um, but in in single entry and stuff like that, you want to go over who you want to play. Probably want to play either Selecki or De La Rosa, and not or Suarez. Just a lot of combined upside there. You, I think that probably the best play overall is the Trevor Peak. Um, and actually, 
I mean, if you really want to know where the best play is, the best play is probably Creel, right? Because remember, he's minus 115, plus takedown upside, you know, and he's under 9K. Um, so it's probably Trevor Peak and Kreloff, the two best plays. Then you want to play either, you know, you want to play De La Rosa, not De La Rosa, keep saying that, uh, Suarez or or the other one, or uh, Selecki. But all these mid-rangers, like one of these, uh, Levitt or Martinez, both these are very, very strong. You want to play an underdog, maybe Osborne would be decent, you know. Um, so, uh, and Anjaminis isn't bad either, but I think that you probably would want to try to find the money for the, the 9400s. Unless again, well, what if you want to play more uh, Muniz with with uh, Aliyev is also a very very good play, and 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 Peak. So let me just try this again. Best plays: Krylov, Peak, um, Krylov, Peak, Armfield, maybe. Those are probably the three best plays. Krelov, Peak, Armfield. That would be my quote-unquote core, I guess. Um, and then just, you know, just hope you get the right combination of these other ceiling games, which these ceiling fights, which are are quite quite a few. Um, okay, so tomorrow we will do the betting breakdown, or maybe Friday, but I wanted to get this out there early while I'm thinking about this, and that'll do it. Good luck.